so far in the last few videos, what we've been doing is um, starting a, a what an absolutely wonderful story um, that connects the topology of a space to how vector fields and functions and differential forms behave on those spaces. Sort of the qualitative analysis of when we can do various things, how many numbers we need to specify something. But so far we haven't used the full power of differential forms because we, I literally took stuff you can express in vector calculus because you're in two and three dimensions and just translated it into differential forms. And we saw that it tended to unify as usual. But let's go ahead and go beyond unification to, uh, to generalization. So another motivation is we have actually seen a two form in R4. That's going beyond the usual vector calculus story. It satisfied df equals zero. It was closed. Here I'm, I have a reminder of that terminology that closed just means d of that is equal to zero. And it was really useful to connect with what's called the vector potential in electromagnetism that it could be written in the form f equals dA where a is a one form on four dimensions. And so that means that it's exact. So this is the same story. If I have something that's closed, is it necessarily exact? Okay, oh, and I need a capital L there. Okay. Um, well, let's look at the, the relationship between these ideas one more time. If alpha is equal to d beta, then d alpha is d of d beta, and that's certainly zero. So exact definitely implies closed. But what about closed implies exact? We've seen counterexamples to that, certainly. When you take something out of R2 or R3, then you can have something that's closed, the d of it is zero, that's not, and it's not d of something. So the vortex vector field in R2 minus the origin, or the, the gravity slash Coulomb field, um, translates into a two form that's closed but not exact in R3 minus a point. Um, so that's, here is what we did in the last few videos. We recap recapitulated the vector calculus stuff, translated into forms. And what we have discovered, one thing we discovered, there's a lot of things really, but the simplest thing is that in each, in R2 and R3, we discovered that these are the same that uh, closed is the same as exact. It's only when you start getting a more interesting topological, uh, it's a more interesting topology by taking stuff out that they start to be different. Okay, so let's see. There's one more case that's kind of, it's nice to just kind of get out of the way right now. What about a closed zero form? Um, and this goes back to the very, very start of those, those topology investigations. A zero form is a function. And closed means d of that is zero. That means a locally constant function. If you're on all of our end, that just means constant. Now, that's not exact, because there's no such thing as a minus one form for this to be d of. But we know that such a form is very boring, meaning it's just a constant, okay? We just need, so this is a constant function, and we just need one number, okay? So zero forms are gonna be a little bit, bit of a special case. Um, but and then everything else is going to be in this pattern of closed is the same as exact. But I had to get that out of the way and make clear that we don't have exactly the same statement. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at p greater than zero. When p equals zero, it's just kind of stupid and trivial. There's some uses to it, but it's not ter terribly interesting. And so we're going to look at z forms with, whose degree is greater than zero. And then we're going to we look at what we did on R2 and R3, and our conjecture is that any closed p form on uh, on Rn is exact as long as it's not a zero form. And this is where we link up with the, just the very, just previous video, is we can actually make an explicit construction. Um, and it's going to be an inductive construction. Okay, so we're going to pick, pick maybe a fixed degree of form, like five forms, and we're going to try to show that in any Rn, all closed five forms are exact. And we're going to do that inductively on the dimension n. So where does that start? What's the base case? Well, the base case is R0, which is a point. Well, in R0, if I'm considering a p-form and the degree is greater than 0, then it's, everything's 0. And so z certainly uh, the 0 form is exact. It's just d of 0. Okay, so that it turns out the base case for induction is trivial. So that means that if we, if, if we assume that any closed 5-form is exact on um, Rn, and we can prove it for n plus 1, then we'll, we'll be done. That's, that will be the induction on the dimension. So here's, here's a warm up before we get to the actual um, whole generality, lots of n's, lots of different indices. Let's do a warm up. Suppose somebody had done the first couple steps of this, and they, they focused on one forms, 
And they have somehow, I don't care how, they got up to this statement, that any closed one form in R2 is exact. That's not the base case. They would have had to do some work to get there. But I wanted to have a warm-up that's kind of in the middle in terms of the difficulty. Not too trivial, but not too complicated. And now our job is to try to prove that any closed one form in R3 is exact. And I'm going to introduce some stuff that's going to seem a little bit ad hoc. I'll explain it vaguely as we go, and then I'll show uh, later how it, there's a very natural interpretation to it. So we've got alpha. Let's just write it out explicitly. That's a one form. And let's not, let's not assume it's closed yet, <clears throat> because I want to be able to define these various operations, even if it's not closed to start with. First of all, first, so we've got to re relate forms on R3 to forms on R2. Somehow we've got to make use of this inductive assumption that any closed one form on R2 is exact. OK, so one way to take a one form on R3 and create a one form on R2 is basically to just kind of restrict it to the set where z equals 0. So we're going to set z equals 0. And so that takes these, this piece of the one form and creates this. And then if I've set z equal to 0, that's a constant. Well, then dz, that's really talking about the variation in z. Or if we think of the bongs of the bell kind of picture or the stacks picture, this is something that measures how much a vector moves in the z direction. Well, if I'm purposely only looking at z equals 0, then I'm not going to be moving in the z direction. So I'm just going to kill dz. And this is a very, very standard thing. In fact, in, in disguise, we've seen it before, but I'll, I'll save that. Let's just say this is the, the operation z. OK, so this is the result of doing z on alpha. OK, um, so we're setting z to 0, killing any dz. And one thing we need to do is, right off the bat, this is all about how d works. and it would be really unpleasant if z and d interacted in a complicated way. So <clears throat> the nice thing is that, in fact, dz is the same as zd. Or in other words, for any alpha, for any uh, form alpha, we've, uh, we're going to take, um, if you did d alpha and then restricted it to the z equals 0, or you restrict it and then take d in the two-dimensional sense, in R2, then you get the same answer. OK, so let's look at the proof of that. It's just a calculation. So dz alpha is d of all this stuff. OK, well, <clears throat> that's going to be, now, now here d is in two dimensions. So it's going to be dp d, uh, I don't need a dx because that would kill here, dy. And that's going to be still of x, y, 0. And then dy wedge dx. OK. And then plus, and then I'm just going to copy and paste and switch some stuff around. Now this one, I don't need the dy. I need the dx. This is going to be a q. And then this is going to be dx wedge dy. OK, so that's dz alpha. OK. Well, what about d alpha? OK, well, d alpha <coughs> is a bit more complicated. OK, we're going to take this guy. Well, let's just, let's just do it from scratch here. That's the partial derivative of p. And I'm just going to leave, whenever it's x, y, z, just without any weirdness on the evaluation point, I'm just going to call it p. OK, and I'll promise to be careful about that if, if we need to. So like dp, d, uh, y, for example. Uh, dy wedge dx minus, or it's like, let's say plus. I'm not going to worry about the order. I write things in right now. dp dz dz wedge dx plus, and I'm just going to put a dot, dot, dot. You're going to get six terms. You're going to get two derivatives of q, two derivatives of r. OK. And then, but then I z it. OK. Well, remember, the idea is that if you have a 2 form on R3, the same deal. You set z to 0, and you kill any dz, even if it's just part of the expression. So for example, this guy is going to go away. This guy is going to live, except I have to remember to set z equal to 0. That's OK. Now, in general, we have to be careful about evaluating versus taking a derivative. But if the partial derivative is in y, and the evaluation is, in, evaluation is in the variable z, then it really doesn't matter. Okay, It's still the same thing. And that's just going to be dy wedge dx plus. Now, what else is going to live? Okay, Well, if I take the, if I look at the dz, and if I look at what that's going to be in d alpha, that's always going to, both those terms are going to have a dz in it, and I'm supposed to kill those. So those won't contribute. 
the DX wedge DZ and the DY wedge DZ, like these guys, those are going to die. The only things that aren't going to die are exactly these two things. Don't need two pluses. Where I've got the DQ DX coming from, from D alpha, and then when I do Z of it, I just set Z equal to zero, and I get exactly the same thing. Okay, so this says it's a very natural thing to do to just smush this down or essentially just look at what alpha does only on the plane z equals zero and create a two-dimensional one form uh, out of that and it commutes with the operation d that's really crucial okay now here's one very easy consequence of that suppose that assume that alpha is closed the question is show that z alpha is closed and hence exact by our inductive assumption good place to pause the video this isn't hard if you're if you're following along see, see, kind of see the general idea if d alpha is equal to zero, then <coughs> um, we want to know if the same thing is true of z alpha. Z alpha. Well, I cal calculate d of z, oops, z alpha. Well, that's the same as z d alpha, uh, d alpha. But hey, d alpha is zero, so that's z of zero, and z of zero is clearly zero. It's a linear uh, mapping. Okay, so in fact, z alpha is closed. That's what we wanted to show. Now here's the big deal. Remember, we're assuming that somebody already showed the, the big statement that we want to prove for one forms in R2. So we've shown that, DZ, that Z alpha is closed, and then hence, by induction, or inductive assumption, inductive hypothesis, if you will, uh, Z alpha, eh, Z alpha is also exact. Okay, that's great. So that might seem a little bit underwhelming because this we certainly are a long way from proving that alpha is exact. Z alpha is a highly truncated uh, version of alpha, but at least we've got something to start with. We've got something being exact. Okay. Now, um, the next thing is we want another operator that takes an, uh, a form on R2 and then sort of inflates it back to a form on R3. Now that's never going to give a general one form on R3. There's not enough information. If I have like beta as ADX plus BDY on R2, that's not enough information to really create a general one form on R3. But it's going to turn out to be a very nice thing to do as well. Here's the thing. Um, this is very much like what you, hopefully you've done a fair amount with vector fields. Take a vector, and we did it in a video just a few times ago with the vortex in R3. You take a vector field and you just copy and paste in the Z, in the Z direction. So here's uh, C beta. To get C beta at a point x, y, z, you just don't make it depend on the z coordinate. So it's just constant in z, and you just take A of x, y, dx. Now, this was dx in two dimensions. This is dx in three dimensions, but they're intimately related, of course. And then B of x, y, dy. So basically, you're saying exactly the same formula that you had here. You just make sure it's constant in z, and you just don't add a dz, which you could have, but you don't. Okay. Um, we are also going to need this for zero forms. Uh, for functions, that's really easy. You extend a function R and R2 just by making it constant in Z. Okay. So once again, we'd like this to interact well with the D, and that's again pretty easy. And then we'll uh, we'll take a, a break for the next video, I think. So D C beta is D of all this stuff considered as a one form in R3. Okay. Well, we know how to do that. That's dA, dy, dy wedge dx, plus, and then I'll just copy and paste and switch things around, plus dB, dx, dx wedge dy. And of course, we would usually combine those together as just dA, d, or dB dx minus dA dy times dx wedge dy. Okay, but I'm not, I don't need to worry about that. That's d of C beta, where notice, I, it hardly even mattered that I had done C on it because I'm yes I'm considering this in three dimensions, but the naturality of differential forms means that I don't care I don't need to know what dimension I'm in the same formulas apply okay C of d beta very similar C of hmm well d beta you know what <laughs> d beta is exactly the same formula it's just that it happens to still be in R two but what does C say it says just take exactly the same formula and consider it in R three. Okay, so it's this. Hopefully, looks pretty tautological, pretty pretty empty of content, and it's supposed to be because C is such a trivial operation. It just extends something as a constant, 
And the way differential forms work means that, of course, this commutes with the D operation. It's really the naturality of D. And again, there's a later problem where I show that it's even a kind of naturality that we've even seen before, although maybe not done, uh, done enough with. OK, let's just do D here. And, uh, and then the interesting part is going to be coming down here with this operator K, but we'll save that for the next video. OK, let's assume that alpha is closed. This is a good one to do on, do on your own, by the way, so if you want to pause the video. If alpha, if alpha is closed, then what do we know before? We know that uh, alpha is exact. So let's write that out in equations instead of just words. Uh, sorry, we know that z alpha is exact. We definitely don't know that alpha is exact yet. This is d beta. And remember, this is living on R2. OK. Well then, what about c z alpha? What do we know about that? Well, we can just take the c operator and a, a, attack a, both sides of that. So c z alpha is c d beta. But hey, what do we just, we just learn? c d beta is the same as d c beta. Oops, I need an equal sign. D, C, beta. And guess what? That's what we wanted to show here. C, Z, alpha is D of something, namely C, beta. OK. So what we've done is we've taken alpha, a general one form, we've kind of squished it down to two dimensions, artificially reinflated it as a much simplified version of itself, which is C, Z, alpha, back in three dimensions. And we have now know that that is exact. OK. Now, the problem is that that's CZ alpha is not alpha itself, but it does encapsulate sort of two thirds of the information of alpha. The extra third is the Z coordinate information. That's where we're really going to have to do some work. And because this basic process of finding, showing that something's exact, is an anti derivative process, at some point an integral is going to have to come in. And that's where this K definition comes in. But we'll save that for the next video.